This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. From MPB Think Radio, this is Money Talks. I'm Kevin Farrell here with Ryder Taft, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. Ryder's a chartered financial analyst and holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. Will you be buying gifts during the next few days or weeks? We want to help you be a more informed shopper by sharing some marketing and psychology tips that are used to get consumers to buy more. Ryder's ready to take your personal finance questions as well. Contact us by email. Our address is money at mpbonline.org. So good morning, Ryder. What's on your mind this morning? Good morning, Kevin. So uh, thinking about the holidays, and we are going to be talking about spending money, and everybody's looking at that, and I hope they are making their budgets for it. It's, um, one of the things that I've been seeing a lot is folks talking about, of course, the state of the American consumer. The American consumer drives our economy, so it's very important that we talk about how they're doing. And a couple of charts people will pull up are how much money people have on credit cards, and it's dramatically higher than it was say a year ago or just or two years ago Uh, and they will also point out to our savings rate which is dramatically lower than it was two years ago but just like one of our uh, faithful listeners astutely pointed out that two years ago was in the middle of a pandemic everything was really weird financially let's back that up further so when you look at credit card spending we're kind of on trend we paid off credit cards to a, a, a large extent with stimulus money et cetera, and uh, cash out refis of our house when interest rates were super low. So we had low credit card balances, low credit card utilization during the pandemic. We're kind of back to normal on that. And uh, in relation to our income, we're, we're, we're probably fine there. However, our savings rate is a bit lower, and that's because we've been spending our savings. So we haven't been putting away extra money. And so I dug a little deeper, and that one is still a a little bit concerning. Our actual dollars saved, Americans' dollars in the bank account, has dropped off this year. It had, of course, spiked during the pandemic. We saved a lot of money during the pandemic. Uh, The beginning of this year, we were were pretty much where we would expect to be. Again, I would say on trend. The American consumer had about $1.3 $1.3 trillion save, which is about what they had saved before the pandemic. And now we're, we're much lower. We're, uh, we're around half of that right now. So a little concerning. I, I hope people are preparing well for the holiday season and not going to go over budget. So we're going to try to empower you to be a more aware shopper this hour, but we also, as usual, want to hear your personal finance questions. So you can email money at mpbonline.org. And kind of glancing ahead at the script, I see one of these methods that I sort of fell for recently, so I'll share that personal experience in just a minute. Uh, But here's another one that's something very similar. In addition to the basic information about retailers giving you information, here's mm-hmm. what we're offering you, here's what it costs, sometimes you'll see something like very limited stock or 500 mm-hmm. people have this in their cart already. What about a false sense of urgency? How do you think that affects shopping? Uh, oh, boy. So actually, I-, I was thinking about this one, and there are – at least two things going on here. One, the false sense of urgency, of course. If there's limited stock, oh, my gosh, I have to get this before it runs out. Um, but also the 500 people have this in the cart. Wow, that's a lot of people on the website at one time. I mean, I guess if it's Amazon or something. But but that also gives you the kind of social proof. Lots of people are buying this. Everybody wants this. Don't you want it too? And so that's interesting to me. And I tend to think these are all uh, false. <laughs> they, they are just making these numbers up. I remember looking at someone who and and it's fairly easy to do to look at the the code behind the website someone did that and you know just tweeted out some screenshots basically that 
uh, little segment there that shows uh, three left in stock or seven people just bought this in the past hour. If you keep hitting refresh, you'll notice that number keeps changing. And so they looked at the code of the website and it was just a random number generator. And it was, <laughs> oh, it's always going to be a number between five and 11 or whatever they've decided is their number. Uh, or sometimes they'll say, oh, Jenny M from Seattle, Washington has just purchased this. And it, it, I think if you hit refresh enough, Jenny M will come back and she'll buy it again. Uh, so, so I would strongly encourage you to ignore those. Um, if you have planned ahead and there is an item, maybe a specific book or a specific product, it's just you have decided that is the one you need. And this happens if you're going shopping and you're saying, oh, I need um, – I need this specific brand of bread. You know, this is the bread that I buy, or this is the the cleaning product that I buy. And the and the shelf is bare except for one of them left. Yes, snatch that off the shelf by all means, but don't snatch it off the shelf because it's the last one. Snatch it off the shelf because it is the one that you already decided you wanted. And and just a sneak preview here: if you haven't listened to our show, most of these tips are going to be about planning ahead and making sure that that is truly the one you want. So so a plan is going to help you go into these situations and making sure it is exactly what you want, aligning your purchase with your value, with your needs. That's going to be what uh, helps you out. You know, this method, uh, I brought something in that I got in the mail that I thought was a little bit bogus, but wanted to get a second opinion. And so it, it deals with um, a home warranty uh, that I don't think mm. I have, but at the very top, it's final renewal notice, attention, and, and capital letters. You you have not contacted us. Call immediately, capital letters. Final attempt to notify you, capital letters. Uh, you you we reserve the right to revoke your eligibility for service coverage after five days. So again, absolutely, and, it, and false and, sense of urgency, well, indeed. And I in mean, this case, it got me a word enough to bring it into you, and we both decided that this is pretty bogus. But yeah, mm -hmm. capital letters and just you know, and so I can understand why people because you you well, and something like this is a little different than buying something, but mm -hmm. still, that it, I understand what they're trying to do. Oh my gosh, I got to react right now. And 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 a good uh, note about things like that, and this is how. A lot of, and that's not necessarily a scam. Maybe that is a company that does offer a product. It's just a very manipulative advertisement of some sort. It's just a very aggressive way of trying to get you to sign up for their product by by trying to tell you maybe, oh, you had this before, but that's just not true. Uh, but a, a way a lot of those things work, those very aggressive tactics, those possibly scammy or fraudulent tactics work is they want you to reach out on the terms that they have set out. So they'll put a phone number in there, but you're getting their call center. So you think, okay, well, my, my mortgage is with Trustmark or with Regents or whatever. I have a login to my mortgage. I have a person that I call and talk. Reach out to the person you have the pre-existing relationship with. That's one of the key ways folks can real, realize that something is a scam. They don't contact that you, you hang up the phone and call your bank back and say, hey, did you just call me about XYZ matter? And yes or no. It, it happens. Sometimes Sometimes they do contact you for reasons that do seem a little out of the blue there. But, but most of the time, just hang up, take a deep breath, call back to the number you know is correct. And it's a shame because I think the when we talk about fishing, which is a little bit related, mm -hmm. but I think the the, pre, the prevalence of fishing now has got to the point where legitimate businesses really can't send you an email or a text message with any kind of useful information because I'm I, oh, I had one where I got a package from UPS a couple of weeks ago, and I wasn't expecting something, and I was like completely freaked out about I don't remember ordering something, and it turned out it was legitimate or whatever. But again, it's like <laughs> you know it's it's yeah. limited in the way. But you're absolutely right. Go ahead. And that whatever you're doing there and call back and say, hey, is this a legitimate thing? And ladies and gentlemen, it has taken us a whole two minutes to go from how to save money while shopping to you're definitely being scammed. So I think the moral of the story is just never, never spend your money. Don't leave the house. Um, be be fearful. So uh, you talked about planning ahead, thinking about your purchases, but uh, marketers try to get us out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, talk, to, if you would, about the decoy effect. Sure. It, and it, it is kind of 
fascinating. All of the strategies, all the psychological trip, tricks, all of the, the art and science of uh, separating you from your money that goes into website design, store design, layout, all of these things, the pricing, even, even the dollars they choose. So the decoy effect is maybe they're going to show you're, you're not going to buy, you're not going to spend $50 on something like a T-shirt. But if you were shown, say, a cheaper T-shirt, and you're like, oh, this is reasonable, and then a much more expensive T-shirt. So to get you to buy, spend $50 on a T-shirt, they might show you a $100 T-shirt. And then all of a sudden, that $50 one doesn't seem super expensive. And you think, oh, well, maybe this $50 one, it's better quality than the $30 piece of clothing. Uh, so I want to balance that. But it's a lot cheaper than the $100. That $100 can't be that much better. And you just reason yourself into it. This is super common. I know... It, it, you can spend. You can look at, at at a at a website's prices for very similar things, and you can drill down into the description of the items. Oh, this one's hundred percent cotton. This one's hundred percent cotton. No, this one was handmade and whatever, and this is handmade and whatever. And 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 you can and drill down and just. And sometimes it's very perplexing. I don't understand the difference between these two garments, uh, but one is twice as much as the other one. Uh, so, so those are kind of decoys that they might throw out for you. But it's interesting because I think they trip themselves up a lot of times because a lot of websites then offer that ability to compare several items at once. And then mm -hmm. if you see that, then you might yes. say, well, look, this $50 T-shirt, you know. Absolutely. And, and be able to spot the decoy that way. And, and, and one, one thing I see that a lot on, and I've, I've used that comparison tool a lot, is on electronics. Electronics or things that have a lot of features because sometimes it'll just be really apparent. And a, a lot of times for uh, electronics or services, they may have a chart comparing them. And sometimes, yes, y y what you are in the market for is the feature that is only on the expensive one. But sometimes it's really reassuring to do that comparison and say, oh, these are identical products from the same product line manufactured by the same person in the same factory, except this one has a an alarm clock on it or whatever it might have on it. And so you, you are assured that, yes, I'm getting the quality product that I need, and it's not more than I need. All right. The next one coming up is one that I've fallen for. So again, I'll, I'll fall in the sword uh, and admit okay, that I've then. done that. But if you have a question for our experts, send an email to money at mpbonline.org. We'll continue our discussion about psychological tricks that are used to get you to spend more. Why did retailers start having holiday sales last month? We've got one reason for you next. By the way, we've got a caller on the line, Lauren from Natchez. We'll get to your call next after this. You're listening to Money Talks. Our website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one way to hear past broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app and listen on your iPhone or Android phone on your schedule. Kevin Farrell here with Ryder Taft, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. One reason retailers start having holiday sales in October may be because holidays are when people are the happiest. And when people are in a good mood, they're willing to spend more money. Look, we were in a good mood because nobody was <laughs> flooding our faces with advertisements. So they've just moved our happiness away. <laughs> it's, they're going to have to start doing it in September now because now we're going to be upset in October because all of the sales and advertisements are overwhelming us. And we're just and we're not happy with that. They keep ruining it for us. Well, so we are talking about ways sellers use tricks to get you to buy more. But first, we do have a caller on the line. As promised, we'll go to Lauren from Natchez. Good morning, Lauren. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Hi, Lauren. Are you with us? All right. Let's put her back on hold. Maybe we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, so number two on our list of things uh, that, uh, you know, again, plan ahead. That's our advice to you. Uh, this one is buying in bundles. Spend $125 and get a free gift. That might yeah. sound like a great idea, but unless you were planning on spending that much anyway, it's not actually a good deal. And Ryder, we were talking about this one. I fell for this one when I bought a PS5. Mm -hmm. It said, hey, you buy something else, you get free shipping. So I bought um, a charger, which is something that was useful. But then after the, comp the, the, the transaction was complete, I said, well, wait a minute. A charger costs more than shipping would have. Right. And, and it's I always find it so frustrating. We, one, every website has some banner across the top of some condition to meet to get free shipping. And so now we are so accustomed to shipping not costing anything that it's 
will do anything to get it. And it's so frustrating to me. I'll have $33.50 in my cart, and I'll say, oh, I'd spend a dollar fifty more, and you get free shipping. And they don't have any products less than $10. <laughs> and, and yes, shipping was only $5 anyway. And I, why don't you just charge me a dollar fifty? more just i will just give you a dollar 50 for shipping instead of paying the five dollars because the five dollar shipping will send you well over the limit so it's very frustrating to me and then you, you mentioned other types of bundles the free gifts again those are just kind of incentives to get you to reach a certain point i was actually on a website the other day I know people are wondering what was i buying i was buying socks kevin all right I was buying socks um and it had a it had a progress bar as you filled up your cart saying, oh, spend, once you hit this next dot, you're going to get a free gift. Oh, one, it, it, there's a dot for a free gift. There's a dot for a free shipping and then another one for you know, discount on what you were buying. And you see the progress bar. You know, oh, if I could just, if I could just get it one more, I'm going to win another prize. Um, that's very, it's, it, but if it's making you spend more money, that's a very frustrating thing. And I actually ended up on that one. Just, you just have to be cool with sometimes not getting the free gift. It's probably not something you wanted anyway. And I think a lot of times the fact that something is free, the value of it to us increases, even though it might be something that's we don't so want weird. or need. Absolutely. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a weird phenomenon. And and then you can say, but I got this for, for free. free. <laughs> Like, it's wow. the wrong size and the wrong color, but it was for free. I just have to use it once for it to be worth it. No. <laughs> I mean, if you don't want it, you don't want it. <sighs> Looks like we've got our caller back on the line. So, again, we'll say good morning to Lauren in Natchez. Go ahead, Lauren. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me now? We got you now. Uh, Thanks. Uh, good, good. I have a comment about the unsolicited mail that uh, was an emergency uh, yes. that you had to go ahead Ooh. and get if you will look where the stamp usually goes, you will see something called pre-sort standard instead of a stamp. That means they've mailed out billions of those things to everybody. <laughs> That's true, yeah. And it, and it may or may not apply to you. And if you don't believe me, hold all that mail for two weeks, and at the end of two weeks, open it all and see how much of it you could actually use or apply to you. And you'll be surprised. Probably won't be any of it that you really need or want. So just... Keep that in mind and save yourself some trouble to open that envelope. Just trash it. That is true. Yeah, those uh, those bulk mail uh, stamps, those bulk mail permits, it just makes it so much cheaper for them to send. That's 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 that junk mail going out. Right, and I have a question for. Um, let's see, I forgot his name already. I just want to know. Did you wind up with two hundred pairs of socks? <laughs> uh, no, I did. I, I I will say I did buy one extra pair of socks to get a discount, but it was totally worth it because the discount was bigger than the cost the of socks. the last two pairs of wow. socks. So it's like I got a free pair. Of, oh, no, we're talking about a free pair of socks now. <laughs> uh, but they were it's 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 some 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 things that is a part of a gift. So it's for, you know, I feel better spending on other people than on myself. Oh, that doesn't cool. make it any better, though, for our listening <laughs> audience. Money is money, and you're still spending it. All right. Exactly. Lauren. Y'all have a blessed day. Thank, thank you. you, Lauren. Thanks for the call and a good point. So if you're concerned about something, as, as Lauren pointed out, look and see if it's a bulk mailer. Absolutely. Uh, you can probably be pretty sure that it's, it's uh, and not necessarily a scam. As you said, this might be a company mm -hmm. that actually does home warranties. It's just a little bit of a... It's an aggressive, very aggressive <laughs> sales tactic they have uh, from the looks of that letter. All right. So we're talking about uh, uh, ways sellers use tricks to get you to buy more. Talk about the instant markdown. So this is so weird. And you see this everywhere. Places will advertise, oh, here's our regular price or here's our retail price. And and but this is the price we're offering to you, to you, Kevin, special today only. We have thought about you and you only and everyone else is paying so much. And I've actually seen these get ridiculous. I once saw somebody <clears throat> marking like an ebook they were selling on their blog as like a three thousand dollar value today for ten dollars and that's just not ever true they, there's not gonna be a discount that big outside of 
even a bankruptcy isn't going to have a discount that big, okay? That That's just absurd. But for the most part, these are just prices that never come up. These are just effectively a higher price that they make up the classic, oh, it's a 20% discount only because they raise the price 25% to start off with. That's just kind of the idea. So some retail price, some uh, normal price, they are making that up. It's just an illusion that a product is worth more than it's being sold for. This tactic is quite frequently used in outlet malls and also in the sort of the discount big box stores mm, where it's clothing absolutely. and the tag says, you know, normally $7 million, your price, 25 cents. But right, my favorite absolutely. example in the mall at uh, one of the sneaker shops, it was retail, sixty nine ninety nine. your price, sixty nine ninety eight. dollars Ooh, what yeah, are you going to so, do with that so penny? Honestly, Kevin, that is one that I would... <laughs> I would actually trust that one. I think that one is true and correct. <laughs> However, it doesn't make it a good price. <laughs> it's only a good price if that's what you are willing to pay for. If that's, and and so again, I I try to think when you're shopping for these. If you're shopping for things you need, the price doesn't quite matter so much. So you shouldn't really care what was the price before. If you have a coupon, if you can get a discount, obviously if you can save yourself some money, that's going to be a good thing. But you shouldn't be comparing to just some hypothetical. You shouldn't even be comparing to what prices other people are getting. I mean, so what if somebody can get it at a lower price than you? This is this is some clothes that you need. This is a, a cleaning product that you need. This is gas in your car. I, you, at the end of the day, you have to do these things. And, and, and once you've kind of figured out the best way to do it, that's it. That's it. Uh, and you can't you can't continue to compare yourself either to some other person or to some ideal out there that, that may not be attainable. All right. What about the BOGO? Buy one, get one. Uh, absolutely. I, I feel that's often a very similar thing is they'll just kind of raise the price. Of course, in the retail shopping world, they do have fairly high margins, so they can offer actual real discounts. So sometimes a buy one, get one is a deal. But generally speaking, again, only go for it. Only say, oh, yes, I will get that other thing. If 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 you do need that, if you're buying two of something to start with, well, absolutely. Or if or if you and a friend are, are splitting something, absolutely go for it. But again, assess it on the total price that you're going to pay anyway, not, not just some made up price of, oh, this is what it used to be and now it is less. Uh, grocery stores do this a lot where it's uh, two. It's, I don't think they Absolutely. call it a buy one, get one, but that's two for $7 or whatever. And, All the time. And I think a lot of people don't realize, and I think I don't can't remember where I saw this recently, but you don't have to get the two to get the discounted price. If you get yeah. at $7, if you get one, they'll only charge you three fifty, so you're still getting the savings. Right, which is always kind of funny to me because I always did like you're saying, think that it was, you had to get that deal. You had to do both of them to get that deal. But very often you're correct. It's, it will be, that is the individual price. What about nostalgia? Does that seem to sell? Yeah. So that's very interesting. Um, so there have been studies published that find nostalgia weakens the desire for money, which is a weird way to put it. It makes people feel more willing to pay for their products. So I think one way to think about it weakens the desire for money is a nostalgic thing, it has a way of making you think, oh, this is something I've always wanted. And it's getting over some of those ideas. When we say one way to, to save, to spend less money is to, is to sleep on that purchase. Think about that purchase for a long time. But if you say, oh, I have been wanting to buy this for years, even if at no point in your past history you had thought of buying this product, uh, you think, oh, that was a thing from my childhood. It, it overcomes some of those things that we do to help ourselves avoid spending money. So nostalgia is overcoming some of those. And also nostalgia tends to add this image of uh, quality, value, and, and making you think that this is a long-lasting product, even if it's just a toy, even if it's just a plastic replica of something, they, it has a way of, of saying, oh, this is a classic product, and you're always saying, oh, well, they did make things better back then, and so you think you're getting something that's maybe higher quality, 
maybe longer lasting or a better value than it actually is. So again, it, it's kind of weird in the way that nostalgia overcomes some of the ways we were trying to save money in the first place. Uh, an example of, of the, the way I don't think this worked was, you know, I, a big video gamer, John uh, Madden football is one of the popular uh, titles. And one year as one of the extras, they were like, oh, look, you can play the game from 10 years ago. Well, with a video game 10 years ago, you're like, it's gonna look really I can't rough. believe that we actually thought that that was, you know, something worth playing or whatever. So with all the classic cheat codes and everything. <laughs> All right, we'll continue our discussion of ways sellers get us to spend more or buy more in just a bit. Have you given your email address to a retailer? Yes, I have, unfortunately. We'll tell you why that's a seller's trick next. You're listening to Money Talks, MPB Think Radio's personal finance broadcast. Kevin Farrell here with Ryder Taft, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. He's a chartered financial analyst and holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. The reason companies want to trade your email address for a small discount is simple. They want to be able to easily reach you with tempting emails and ads about their awesome products to make you buy from them again and again. So maybe have an email account just for online shopping or have willpower. You can also unsubscribe from their emails after you get the discount. And I'll say I've fallen for this a couple of times and I've been too lazy to unsubscribe, but it is amazing how... They will bombard you. I mean, I, there are several things that, and it, to me, it's you got to figure out is the initial discount worth what might be the future kind of, you know, gosh, not another email from them. Well, what I will say is a website where there is an initial discount, it often is worth it because you're probably going to have to give them your email address when you check out anyway, and they're going to do the same thing with it. Uh, what I'll say, a couple of things. You just have to be aggressive about unsubscribing. Every now and then, I will I just have to go through, I have to unsubscribe to a lot of things because sometimes you think, oh, I'm, you know, I may want to purchase from them later. Oh, this is a new store. I, I may forget about I may want to remember. You, you just have to remember unsubscribe to those marketing emails and often they will give you the opportunity to unsubscribe to just marketing emails you can still get other sorts of alerts you can um, of course you will still get emails if you buy something get get your tracking information so you just have to be aggressive about unsubscribing your email address is very valuable to folks though because it costs them nothing to add another email address to their email list they don't have to pay for somebody else's time to craft a special email to you but they get that really targeted you are seeing that full advertisement and that's all it is it's it's advertising directly to you so you just have to be careful about that and in my case <clears throat> one of them was uh, a shoe company and so i realized that i would probably keep them because you know i would be more willing because to buy like, it. yeah right mm -hmm. yeah, we so know. You, <laughs> you've got to determine sort of who's sending the emails and whether it's worth and again it's i think the main thing w with my problem is it just it just clogs up your email yeah account. I know that I'm getting yeah. close to almost to running out of room in my Gmail account. And I think the major reason that is, is it's just incredible. emails, you know, from marketing emails. Yeah. So. And you also have to worry about, uh, especially a larger company, they may be, they may have multiple brands, multiple stores. So you kind of wonder, oh, how am I getting an email from this store? Well, because they're the same company that you already gave your number to. And another one is that some places may be selling that information. So do check it. Don't, don't go for a 5% discount if it means you're going to be harassed for the rest of your life. Back to the phone lines we go, starting in Pascagoula, our friend Brother Daniel on the line. Good morning, Brother Daniel. Go Good ahead. Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving to my brothers from another mother. I want to thank y'all. I'm going to do it real quick. I want to thank y'all for helping me align my uh, car payment with my with them. They're more hungry for me to stay in the car than for me to get out of the car, because, you know, cars depreciate. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then also... I want to thank y'all for getting me into the CD and understanding the stock market, which I'm trying to teach a lot of our young people right now how to learn about how and to use the investments and to listen to PBS in the morning. So I wanted to thank y'all for that. Yes, because y'all are the saviors for Mississippi, and I want to thank you so much. My mom loves you. She never really listened to the channel since the 70s and the 80s, and she is back. So please, everybody, tell your family, come on, money talk. Learn how to grow some plants. Learn how to cook right here on PBS. I want to thank you. Y'all have a blessed Thanksgiving. Absolutely. You too, Brother Daniel. I hope you have a, a great Thanksgiving. I know I'm very grateful, uh, very thankful for our regular callers and our super fans out there, including, of course, Brother Daniel. 
All right. Thanks, Daniel. Good call. We appreciate hearing from you this morning. On we go next. John is on the line from Hancock County. John, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I was listening to your program, heard the young lady talking about the junk mail. Mm-hmm. Well, I have a solution for part of it. Okay, I go ahead. I got tired of getting mail from one company, and uh, so I sat down and wrote them a letter and told them to take me off of their mailing list. That didn't work. They increased it. Oh, I wow. Ended up getting, I ended up getting five, six, sometimes seven envelope pieces of mail from them containing the same thing. Every one of them had a return <laughs> uh, envelope in it with prepaid postage. I gathered up. I saved all of that mail for a month. Stuck it in a manila envelope. And with a letter, it said, take me off your mailing list. Stuck it in there, put that postage paid um, uh, envelope on the outside of it, sent it back to them. All the ones that I didn't use for the manila envelope, I just sealed and stuck it in the mail. They were empty. Sent it back to them. And about two weeks after that, I haven't gotten any more of their mail. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. That's very that's very clever. And I know there are some uh, do not mail to me, do not send uh, catalogs, etc. to me lists out there. I don't think those are very reliable. And and as well, a lot of junk mail is kind of delivered door to door anyway. It's it seems so. That's a very clever idea, John. I I, I like the sound of but that. Man, after I did that, it was about two weeks later. I quit getting their mail. So I haven't got it in any of it for two years now. All that's right. that's incredible work you've done there. Way to go. Good job, John. You outfoxed him. Thanks for your call this morning. This is Money Talks. We're talking about methods that uh, marketers sometimes use to, I don't know if trick is the right word to use, but encourage us to maybe buy more than we uh, are willing to or initially thinking about. Um, tricks for high dollar purchases. So you see this a lot more now. You see installment plans. You see the buy now, pay later plans. They're essentially they'll split up a call, a large dollar expense into four or, or so installment payments. I've seen some of those aggressively as much as every week, and it's just I just kind of think. Uh, Okay, I mean, if it's if I'm going to be spending it by the end of the month anyway, I wouldn't have if I put it on my credit card now. I wouldn't have paid that till the end of the month anyway. I, there's no discernible difference to me. Um, some of those do charge a fee. Some of those do charge interest, uh, but they are ways. They are ways very helpfully sometimes of making a purchase more affordable. But the fact of the matter is, don't just look at that small payment. Don't just say, "Oh, it's twenty five dollars." No, it's four payments of twenty five dollars. Uh, so it is still a hundred dollars. You still need to have a hundred dollars to buy it. Again, I would say treat these just like you would treat a credit card. Do not spend that amount unless you could afford that whole thing. If there's some benefit to delaying it. Great. Absolutely. Maybe there you get some extra discount with the store. You know, maybe. Great. Go for it. But again, only if you can afford it and don't get roped into doing that all of the time. One of the big box stores used to have something on their display. It would be, you know, $30 only blank per month on your card. Uh, well, then it's like, well, that's if you never purchase anything else on the card. So mm. that was a tricky way to do that. And uh, Liz, our producer, points out that uh, cell phone companies seem to be big on the monthly. In fact, when um, when I was purchasing my latest iPhone, <clears throat> I was trying to go through my mm -hmm. carrier, uh, which there was this great deal. It's the company that's like, oh, we got deals for new and existing customers. Do I get one? Do I get one? Anyway, uh, the only way that you could get the discount was that if you used the installment plan. Mm -hmm. And if you used the installment plan and paid it off early, you would would forfeit the benefit, the savings from the thing. And so I went and through Apple and got a similar discount, but it was able to pay for it all at once because of something like that. If I have That's the money, so I want to just – because to me, a, a, a paid off on time thing to me is just something hanging over my head for X amount of months right. to where, like I said, if I can afford to pay it off now, I want to have it, and that way I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that is very interesting, those installment plans, especially with phones. Because you're already paying that monthly bill anyway, those have gotten very common, and that's really frustrating. 
Uh, what about the actual store itself? Can that influence uh, purchasing? So like the way that a store is laid out, yes, kind of like we were talking about the top of the show, the psychology, the art and the science of getting you to spend money is is so interesting. And when you read about or hear about the history of some stores, the way they develop their layout is always going to be part of it. The way they set up their merchandise is always going to be part of it. Why are the teen clothing stores dark with loud music? Why? Why are, why are grocery stores so brightly lit and why is every grocery store, the produce is on this side when you walk in and the, and the frozen foods on the other side when you walk in and all the meats are in the back uh, when you walk in. So a lot of times stores will be set up, especially larger stores, department stores, they're set up in a way that the thing that everyone comes in for, so your your meat and vegetables, is going. you're going to have to walk through everything else to get to it. So you will see people design, I've seen people design budgets around this. I've seen people design diets around this about how you walk through the grocery store. And again, most of the time it is, you can do a circle around your grocery store. You're going to hit your, your fresh vegetables, your fresh meats, your dairy, your frozen foods and get out without going into the middle where it's often the packaged foods, usually much higher margin foods. Uh, Not, it's not necessarily that that's going to save you a ton of money, but often it is it is the higher margin products, the things with brightly colored boxes that will lure you in and, and encourage you to spend more than you otherwise would have. So that's a really fascinating to think thing to look at. Again, just the way people, just the way things are put on the shelves. So sometimes there is some sort of logic to organization on the shelves. They'll put large, heavy things on the bottom and lighter weight things at the top just because that's good for safety. But also things at your eye level or things at your child's eye level (laughs) that are easy to grab and brightly colored. Everything on a shelf is is going to be similar. You know, they're categorizing things together, but maybe those cheaper things are a little harder to reach, harder to find, and less attractive spot. And so this is just all back towards having a plan. When you go into that store, knowing exactly the products that you want to have, having a list, and really executing on that list. Um, one thing I really like, actually. Uh, the kind of combination of online shopping and shopping in person. I will occasionally have need to go to a big box store to buy something. I will look up on their website. You can usually plug in your store and always be a little cautious about this because this helps them make their marketing more targeted to you. But again, if I'm, if I'm going to be going to the store anyway, I know what I'm getting into. But they will say, some stores will go so far as to say where on the shelf your product is. You could blindfold yourself and walk to that product. And I, I don't encourage you blindfolding yourself, but, <laughs> but you know it is you know, shelf one on aisle H. You go in there, you look for aisle H, you go to shelf one, you grab your product and you get out. Uh, know what is there. And and if you've kind of checked it out online, you already know what they have. You know there's no need to look around. And besides, you're a busy person. you got to get home anyway. So, so that's very useful. Any of these tricks to help you spend less time wandering through the store. Again, go in there with a plan. Don't go in there to shop. Don't, don't go to the grocery store to find out what you're eating tonight. That's just a terrible idea. I do have a problem though with uh, the apps for some of the big uh, mar- the big stores that the inventory like X number left and then when you get to the store there are none left and it's kind of like mm. how can this not I mean everything is scanned on you know the the price codes and everything so I that's one thing that is because really Jane L from Seattle just put it in her <laughs> cart and she is she has taken it off the shelf <laughs> seventeen people have this in their cart they should have that announcement going on in the store hi are you looking for trash bags 12 people in this store are buying trash bags you should probably buy trash bags (laughs) that's a brilliant idea i think you've got something there we'll continue talking about tricks used to get you to spend more money these aren't old tricks we'll tell you a trick from the 1930s that's still in use today we're glad you found our show money talks kevin farrell here with Ryder taft portfolio manager at new perspectives here's a program reminder tuesdays at 10 a.m listen live to in legal terms on mpb think radio immediately following our show. So back in the 30s, retail stores started pushing shopping carts near their entrances to inspire customers to make larger purchases. 
The idea behind it was simple. Customers won't buy heavy, expensive items if they can't carry them around the store and to their cars. It's brilliant. Yep, still in use today. I mean, I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine shopping, going grocery shopping, going shopping at a big box store without a shopping cart today? I mean, that's that's a brilliant innovation. Well, I've done, especially at a grocery store. I've only got a couple of items, but it's amazing how quickly your arms fill up when you've got one of mm-hmm. these and one of those and that sort of thing. Although I do like. The design of the little miniature shopping cart. I like those better than the the big ones. <laughs> yes, and that's one of the things that when you read articles, when you, I don't know, if you watch a documentary about the sh- history of various stores, this these little innovations, all these small things, the way stores are laid out, the way aisles are laid out, the way stores have changed from you approach a salesperson and tell them what you need and they go bring everything to you, to this you are on the hunt for all of your things the way that has changed shopping and the way that's changed spending. It's really incredible to see. Sue from Beaumont is on the line, and she's up next. Good morning, Sue. You're on the air with us. Good morning. I'd like to ask y'all a question. <clears throat> I have a car that I bought at a dealership and paid it off, and then after that I start getting these urgent letters. We want to buy your car. I mean, mm. it's big, urgent type, type, you know, and uh, it, it, we will give you a $500 discount. Now, who do, who do they think in this world is going to go and get $30,000 for a new car for a $500 discount? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great point. And that's happened more and more recently as the price of used cars. I think we talked about this on last show or the one before. The price of use, so the price of cars has gone up a lot because there's fewer available and more people are wanting cars. So the high demand, low supply price goes up. But really, what's really driven the price increases has been the price of used cars going up so much. And so it has been more attractive. And I've gotten those letters myself. I'd be surprised if there's someone who has bought a car in the past few years from a dealership. So recently enough to still be on the dealer's uh, email list and uh, address list and has not gotten an offer. They're offering to, one, buy your car at a reasonable price and also give you some discount on a new car. They always want to do that. They want to encourage sales because that helps helps them that helps them with their incentives but they also they're also going to make money on that difference there because they're going to take your car that they've bought x you know spent x dollars on they're going to turn around and sell it for a little bit more and then of course they're going to get a profit on when you buy another car so that happens all the time and it is really fascinating how much that is happening right now Uh, yes it really annoys me you know (laughs) yeah so i've done the same thing but where you know your car gets paid off you're finally happy and then all of a sudden it's like we want to buy your car back from you and it's like uh uh-uh you know um so (laughs) now i just did all this work and yeah. sort of as an addendum to that, I would say if you're selling a used car, I would try the personal market first because the last time I got rid of a vehicle, the money I got just selling it from private sale from one person to another was a lot more than the mm-hmm. dealership was willing to give me because, again, the dealership has to get it and then resell it and try to make yeah, some money off of course. it. So uh, good call, Sue. Thanks for, for, for you calling in this morning. Uh, we were talking about some of the things you see in supermarkets and this one is interesting, um, Ryder. It's called parasite placement. So it's those little things that attract you uh, at the at the cash register, the the chocolate bars and the and the gum and that sort of thing. Oh yes, yeah, so that's the the classic impulse purchase items. Uh, the the tabloid magazines with the outrageous covers that just make you oh what what did the queen say to so and so or or what is the drama behind the story behind this drama that I recently saw on TV so those things anything that has a really big catch to it uh, just a small snack that's why you often see candy there just like oh you know what I, I could why wait I could grab that Snickers right now uh, just things like that are put on displays just those last minute one time they're not going to put a case of drinks up there but they are going to have a display case of drinks so you could just grab one for the road it's going to be the bottles not the cans because again it's all about what could i just grab in my hand and have right now and sometimes i always feel like they're they're making you sit in a long line just so you'll stand in front of that display case for longer 
So this last one, we're right out of time, but I thought this one was interesting. Fast food restaurants want customers to come in, eat quickly, and leave, so they offer plastic chairs that get really uncomfortable after a while. I, I mean, think that's, that's true. I mean, that, that could be fair. Although yeah. it's changing to where now they don't even want you to, and a lot of places, is you're, you aren't going to have a place to go in anyway. I read in something online yesterday that a number of uh, fast food places are going to, like, you know, pretty much drive throughs only. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's interesting. I think as a result of the pandemic, they, I guess they figure it's easier if to manage. If you can sit in your car and eat, like, why would we spend the money on the chair? <laughs> uh, absolutely. And, and, Another one, just go in with a plan when you're spending money. That's always going to be the first line of defense. All right. That's a good bottom line for today. Money Talks is a production of MPB Think Radio, funded in part by generous financial support from listeners. To hear today's show or previous show, you can visit moneytalks.mpbonline.org or listen to the podcast by searching for Money Talks. Our show is produced by Liz Gill. Our podcast producer is Jermaine Flood. And our call screener today was Charles Arnold. So for Ryder Taff, I'm Kevin Farrell. Join us every Tuesday at 9 for Money Talks. It's heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on